and now I will um, crank up the bench power supply slowly and we'll see what happens. Holy! Hey guys, Cavecan here. I made this project out of fun, curiosity and for entertainment purposes. Uh, this is not a highly scientific video, at least not for now, because I wanted you to ask, to leave me comments um, about the question, does a CO2 laser tube generate any X-rays or even gamma radiation? Now I read plenty of reports um, from everywhere in the world online, uh, but as I am a complete greenhorn in things of radiation physics, I could only guess uh, what these diagrams mean. Uh, one thing that I think to understand though is that uh, Pulsing a very high powered laser light um, could generate X rays at the point of impact where the laser beam hits your material. Generating X rays is surprisingly easy and scary. Uh, in the same time, why? I will tell you later. Um, it only needs a few essential components very high voltage, a vacuum tube with a filament inside uh, that acts as a cathode, and an anode on the other side. If you are thinking what I am thinking, we. Never mind, we talk about this later. Basically, all those requirements already are combined inside of a laser tube. I mean, we have a vacuum of around 10 tor inside of our laser tube. That is about um, 13 millibars or 0.19 psi. The remaining air got replaced with CO2 that makes a laser tube or a CO2 laser tube work. Um, the pressure around us, however, on um, this planet at least, lies around 14.7 psi. So we are talking about a vacuum inside of our laser tube. We have an anode and we have a cathode. We have high voltage and we have the vacuum. So we have all the requirements to generate X-rays. But uh, as a comparison, how about X-ray tubes? Let's have a closer, simplified look of an actual X-ray tube and how it works. The most easy and basic X-ray tube was invented by Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen in 1895. It consisted of a glass bulb with a cathode on one side and an anode coming in sideways from down below on the other side. However, it wasn't Röntgen who invented this sort of bulb. It was physicist Julius Plücker and uh, Johann Wilhelm in 1869 who discovered that when applying a high voltage to the bulb it started glowing in a eerie green bluish color. The cathode rays were discovered. But Röntgen wanted to find out if there are any other rays that this device is producing. He found out that when he was covering the experimental setup with a black box, a piece of paper on the other side of the room remained glowing even all the outgoing light of the bulb was entirely covered. Long story short, Röntgen found out that when electrons that were generated at the cathode get fired to the anode due to the negative potential, the electrons on impact create heat and X-rays. The X-ray tube was born, but it sure took years to refine the principle of the tube to generate X-rays in a way they can be used for medical appliances for example. X-rays spread uh, the same way than uh, light rays do in, in the visible spectrum. Speaking of spectrum, when we take a look at this chart, we see that X-rays are way shorter in wavelength than a, a infrared CO2 laser, for example. But as we saw in my video about laser safety, a CO2 laser tube can also generate some minor UV radiation, so why not also X-rays? Well, um, I was trying my best to find some answers, but um, it comes out that this is quite a tough question. Uh, therefore, hey you, you uh, physicists uh, on uh, your computer, can you help me out answering uh, my question? Um, is there a chance that a CO2 laser tube produces X-rays as a side product? Just leave me a comment below. The University of Nebraska Lincoln, by the way, is about to develop a what they call synchrotron X-ray laser source. That might be the future in X-raying altogether. They found a way to generate X-rays by using lasers, what makes the actual X-ray unit small enough to fit inside a truck. Um, the coherent rays um, can be used way more efficient than the conventional ones and reduce the doses of radiation for the patients. Now, in the meantime of waiting for some kind comments, maybe, um, I don't want to be considered uh, of being lazy, so I thought to try something out on my own using this relic. Um, this is a Geiger counter. 
probably out of the 50s or 60s. Yeah, I know, this is like the try of flying to Mars uh, with a bottle rocket. But hey, this um, CDV 707A is still somewhat calibrated. It should give me a reading when there is any emitted radiation. It won't pick up low level radiation, for example, when you want to check on your food. Uh, but it shows when something abnormal is happening. These old civil defense Geiger counters have a test source on the side and uh, when calibrated correctly in a times 10 scale, the needle should stay between 0.2 and 0.3 milli Röntgen per hour. Um, 0.25 is 2.5 microsievert per hour. Now another relic from the bunker are these dosimeter pens. They are also pretty interesting. They are meant to be worn in your chest pocket. That's why they have this little clip here. And um, they are measuring the exposure to radiation over time. Um, those are completely analog uh, things. Um, you have a lens in here and you have a little scale in there um, that reaches I think from zero to 200 uh, Röntgens per hour. Um, and a hairline needle that will um, move over time depending on the exposure you um, are going through. To read them out, uh, basically all you have to do is you have this little lens in here and you hold it against the light source and you can see the scale inside. It's all analog and you need this little box here to reset them because once they, you know, um, once they uh, uh, made their measure measurements over a couple of hours or days, uh, you need to reset them uh, to zero so they're completely recyclable um, or reusable. Um, you need this little box, um, you have this port here and when I push this down you can see that there is a little light bulb in there that goes on when I push down onto this. So when I put this on, um, this helps me, well, it illuminates uh, the scale so I can see it when I watch, look through it. And then I have this knob and I can bring down this hair needle um, to zero by using simply this little uh, potentiometer. So uh, what I will do, I will put three of these things um, inside of the K4D laser over the next days while working with it to see if they give me any reading. Okay, so I zeroed out my three dosimeters. I want to put them into three strategic points um, where I suppose that if at all x-rays could be emitted. So I will put one right next to the high voltage line of the laser. Of course I unplugged the whole system. Second one I will put inside of the housing or compartment of the laser tube. So when we have a look here, you can see the high uh, voltage line, that's positive. And then we follow down this black line, which goes straight to the anode. So the anode is the point where supposedly there could be X-rays happening, which is this metal thing you can see here. So I will put this dosimeter right next to this. Number three will be inside of the laser bed. I thought maybe I can just tape it or put it on here. By the way, um, the uh, ionization chamber is down here. So I will put this as close to the laser head as possible. Now the next thing I want to do, I want to take some direct measurements. Therefore I use my, my, my oldie. <laughs> Geiger counter thing. Um, to do this, I will put this in uh, times one, which is the most sensitive scale. And uh, usually when I hold this against the check source, oh wait, I can switch on this little speaker here so we have some acoustics. And uh, you can see and hear, and this is totally maxing out the scale now because it's on the most sensitive mode. Now I will put this next to the uh, high voltage power supply to start with. As I said, I unplugged the whole thing. So I will put this down here, right next where the uh, red cable is coming out. Now let's give it a try. Three, two, one. Okay, so there is absolutely nothing. We'll secure the laser, turn the machine off, we'll unplug the machine. Now, no measurement for now. Now, next thing I want to do, I want to put this next to the laser tube. As I said, if there is any radioactive radiation 
coming off this thing. It should be at the anode right down here. Okay, so let's give this a try. I'll put on the laser again. I'll activate the laser switch and give it a burst in three, two, one. Okay, nothing at all for now. Let's try it uh, inside of the laser bed. Something like this. Three, two, one. Okay, as you could see, there was no reading at all. Um, it doesn't matter where I measured, um, there was nothing. Uh, I, I could be wrong, but I am pretty convinced that there are no x-rays produced inside AK-40 laser. But if you know better, leave me a comment below and uh, let me know. For my understanding, a CO2 laser tube is a continuous laser source powered by DC current. Um, it is not pulsed, what seems to be essential uh, for creating high energy x-rays. Um, what we would need are very high peaks of energy for a very, very short amount of time in the nanoseconds range to create x-rays. Okay, so we are two days later. Um, I spent it the whole day yesterday to, um, of cutting out things and I needed to engrave a lot of stuff for work. And um, all in all, the machine was running for approximately six hours non-stop while engraving. Um, I already took out our um, dosimeter tubes and I put on a little label here and uh, yeah, let's have a readout. Let's see if uh, we have any proof of uh, ionizing radiation inside of the laser on a long term or at least a six hour long term of usage. So the first one will be the one um, I put in the laser bed. So let's have a look. Okay, so I really, I really put them on zero. So this one now is like uh, hundreds of a millimeter off the zero to the right, which probably is normal because you always doesn't matter where you are, you have background radiation. So uh, next one we have the one by the uh, of the power supply. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's nothing much else or nothing much different than the laser bed because we don't have a spark gap or any part where there could be any radiation to be happen happening let's have a look yeah <laughs> this is gives me the exact same reading than the other one so it is a little bit off the zero but nothing that could be considered to be somehow unnatural or something let's move on to the last one which is in my opinion the most interesting one because that's the one we put in next to the laser tube or the anode of the laser tube so the only real part of the laser where x-ray appearing could happen let's have a look <laughs> that one is straight on zero that didn't move at all so no readings on the pens either luckily a pretty boring result I would conclude that a k40 laser machine does not generate any x-rays but I'm still waiting for your comments uh, I could be wrong I mean those measuring tools I have here are old, they are not made for measuring very low amounts of radiation or so. Um, they are probably more to measure, you know, fallout uh, in the Cold War or whatever. But um, I thought I should test these at least if they are picking up any x-rays. And um, as we are already in the man cave and I don't want to finish this video without anything happening, I thought, uh, why not generate some x-rays? This is a Tesla coil. Um, I got this for a project uh, a couple of years ago. This is basically an up converter that converts 24 or 27 volts to 100,000 volts, 100 kilovolts. So uh, a very high amount of voltage with a pretty low amount of current, uh, at least for this model. Um, now, what else did we need? Hmm. Right, we need a vacuum tube with a tungsten wire in there that acts as a cathode. So, what about a bulb? The only thing we don't have in this bulb is an anode. And uh, as you may know, plasma balls 
those spheres um, with you know those mystical uh, power thing inside or um, those arcs happening um, when you touch them you get a bigger you know you get a bigger uh, arc touching your finger um, maybe you heard about the trick of putting some uh, aluminum foil onto a plasma ball so we could do the same thing and use a piece of aluminum foil as our anode on the other side and um, then we have to hook up this to something grounded like um, yeah like this uh, uh, roll of, of solder just to you know give it a, a nice ground to arc to so um, I will not show you in detail how I built this I don't think that well there are enough videos on YouTube they show how to build this um, I consider it to be very dangerous even I don't think it will work but I will try this out right now and um, I will see you in a second when this build will be finished. Okay, so um, the only thing I did, I swapped the spool of solder against um, some steel plates because they simply give more earth and more grounding. I uh, glued this um, probe to a little camera stand and now I will put this on on the times one setting which is like the, the most sensitive setting. I have my Tesla coil hooked up and now I will um, crank up the bench power supply slowly and we'll see what happens. Holy shit. Okay, seriously, guys, before you go down in the comments to call me names and how stupid I am, uh, I know what I'm doing. That was an edit trick, okay? I would never stay in the same room with an active X-ray source. I mean, of course not, come on. Um, I know what I'm doing. I ran a lot of cables to another room, which is about 35 feet away. Um, I have my bench power supply there. I have my uh, iPhone set up in a way that I can monitor both cameras from there. It is fascinating. I understand that. Um, it showed that this thing works. Um, it uh, gave me a reading between two and three milliroentgens an hour. Um, but all after all, this thing is ridiculously dangerous. I mean, come on, we're talking about x-rays, okay? Um, I mean, everybody has this little booklet you go, when you go to the doctor to make an x-ray um, that they can check how many x-rays you already had this year. Um, so don't play around with this stuff. Anywho, um, I managed to take some pretty nice pictures, especially of this bluish-greenish glow um, that I want to show you. impressive right I hope you enjoyed this video I need to disassemble this thing right now and um, yeah I hope I see you in the next one until then see ya